Hi, everybody. Uh, so I have the honor of introducing tonight's speaker. Our guest this evening is an astronomer, author, and popular science blogger. He holds a PhD in astronomy at the University of Virginia and was part of the Hubble Space Telescope team at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. He established the website and blog Bad Astronomy with the goal of clearing up widespread public misconceptions about astronomy and space science in movies, the news, print, and on the internet. In his own words, the universe is cool enough without making up crap about it. As an author, he has written two books, including Bad Astronomy and Death from the Skies, which details doomsday events that the cosmos could send our way to destroy our planet and life as we know it. He has appeared on approximately a bazillion shows on the Discovery Channel. He's been nominated for an Emmy Award, and in 2008, he even had an asteroid named after him. We're so lucky to have this superstar here to spend time with us tonight. Please welcome Dr. Phil Plate. Yay, and I'll stop sharing here. Phil, you. if you wanna take over. Yeah, one of these days I've got to observe that asteroid. Um, other people have and have sent me pictures. And uh, so that's really cool, but I've never seen it for myself and it shouldn't be that hard to find. So I should do that. Years and years and years ago, when I was a kid, um, there were nine planets in the solar system, and then we misplaced one a few years ago. Um, but we didn't know if other planets around other stars existed. And there was no reason to think they didn't. Um, we didn't really know a whole lot about how planets formed. So uh, we didn't know if this was a really, really rare event or if it's something that happened naturally with stars when stars are born. Um, and then over the years, uh, it became clear that stars... Um, when they were born, looked like they could form planets. We started seeing things around stars. It's like, that kind of looks like that might be affected by a planet. And then finally, in the 1990s, um, we started finding these uh, planets, which are called exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars. Um, and it was very exciting um, to be an astronomer during those times, I'll tell you. Uh, it was really neat to see the, all this data coming in and, and uh, with all these planets. And I remember thinking at the time that, um, you know, we're, we're just, every time you discover a new one, when there's like 10 known, every new one that's found is like a big deal, right? We've just discovered another planet, woo! And I, and I realized there's gonna come a day when we're gonna be like, oh, we've discovered a new five planets. Like, oh, I'll throw them on the pile, you know? They've got, got so many of them now, it's like no big deal. And I, I realized that there was gonna be a time where we had plenty of discoveries of these things, but not enough to be able to do what I think of as, as zoology, to be able to say, we're seeing planets like this, and we're seeing planets like that, and we're seeing planets around this kind of star more than that kind of star. You know, when the, when the numbers weren't that big, uh, it was really hard to be able to categorize these things. And I started thinking about that and realizing that eventually, yeah, we're gonna have enough planets that we're gonna start seeing trends. And whenever, whenever you're doing science in a new field, trends are what you want to find. You wanna know what's going on. If you find one thing, it's like, well, why does this thing exist? Why does it do what it does? Uh, and if you find more and more and more of these things, you start to see trends and trends are where you start to um, hang your physical laws off of. You know, this is how gravity works. This is how fluids flow. All of the math and physics that go into all that stuff, you have to have examples of these things to figure out what's going on. Um, and it occurred to me, it's like, you know, the big question, it occurred, this occurred to everybody. I'm not special, um, but it occurred to everybody. It's like, are we going to find another earth? And it turns out that's hard to do. Um, and I'll get into that. Uh, and I knew that we would find a lot of planets first. And I, I became very curious to know, not so much if we could find another Earth, but to find out if Earth itself is special in some way. Do we find a lot of planets that are kind of like Earth? Maybe not exactly like it, but good enough. Do we, do we not see any planets like the Earth? Don't know. And um, there came a time a couple of years ago where uh, we started getting enough information that we could ask this question and start to answer it. And so the subtitle of this talk, Strange New Worlds, it was originally called Is Earth Special? But I like Strange New Worlds better. So I made that the subtitle. Do you want to answer that? Well, the answer is no, maybe, yes, sometimes. It depends. It's complicated. 
And typically in science, the answer you're looking for depends on the question you ask. How you ask that question is going to guide how it's answered. And that's what we're going to find out here tonight. You may recognize this planet. This is Earth. Um, this was taken by the Discover satellite, which is a satellite that orbits the sun about 1.5 million kilometers closer to the sun than the Earth. And it's turned around, faces the Earth, and takes a picture um, several times a day. Um, typically, when you show a picture like this, you show North America and South America, but that's kind of biased. I actually wanted to show something you don't usually see. So, you know, clearly there's Africa, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, a little bit of, uh, of Russia there, and you can see the European uh, subcontinent. Um, I always try to look and find it. It's hard to see. You can see a little bit of Antarctica, I think, there at the bottom. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but still, there's a fairly typical view of the Earth. You see some ocean, you see some clouds, you see some land masses, you recognize it. Um, however, this is not a, a really typical view of Earth. This is a typical view of Earth. This is centered over the Pacific Ocean. Um, this is a very large body of water. And I know that may sound obvious, but it's really, really big. At the upper right-hand corner there, you can see North America, the California coast, and maybe you can see Baja, California there. Um, at the lower left, there's uh, Australia, uh, and that's it. I mean, the Hawaiian Islands, I believe, are too small to see in this picture. Um, there's a glow in the center. That's actually the sunlight being reflected back to the satellite. So there's just a little bit of a glow there. But um, this, is, this is fairly uh, typical of Earth. Earth is a water planet, three quarters or so covered in water. Um, the Pacific Ocean, it, it, it's so big, it's hard to explain. I flew to Australia once from San Francisco and um, you know, 10 minutes after leaving the airport, I was over the Pacific Ocean. And then 13 hours later, I was over the coast of Australia. And it's like, it took all that time to cross that, that, that ocean, it's huge. Um, and this is, in a nutshell, something super important to us, and that is water. Water is uh, the foundational uh, uh, substance that life is based on. And um, water is, is really good for this. Um, it, the, the temperature range between freezing and boiling is quite large. It takes a lot of energy to melt ice and to boil water. So um, it, it's actually a very stable substance. You can throw minerals in it and those minerals can dance around and, and, and do things. They can dissolve and reform for more complicated uh, 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 molecules. And so life on earth, because water is abundant, uh, life on earth, it, well, because water is abundant and water is a great medium for this, um, life is abundant on earth as well. And in this picture, you see three forms of water. Uh, it's liquid, obviously, the blue. It's a vapor in those white clouds. And there's ice as well at the very bottom, maybe a little bit at the top. I think there's some ice there in the, uh, the upper left there at the, near the North Pole. So water exists in, in three different forms on Earth simultaneously. And uh, that's very helpful too. Water evaporates, goes up into the sky, forms clouds that moves over land masses and then rains down. And then rivers take that water someplace else. So water is mobile. And that's also important as well. If life forms in one place, it has basically a vehicle to spread all over the planet. Uh, and you're constantly recycling it, it, it that, that keeps the system energized. So when we are talking about what makes Earth special, one thing we might say is, well, we've got lots of water. So that's something to keep in mind. I'll be talking about that quite a bit over the next six hours of this lecture. Um, so let's see here. Next. All right. So let's look at our solar system and ask ourselves, when we look at the solar system, is Earth special? Well, this is a, uh, a semi-scale uh, artwork of the solar system. The planet's sizes are scaled correctly to the sun, but of course the distances are not. If, the, if these were the distances to the sun, we'd all be dead. But you can see Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. These are the four rocky worlds that are close into the sun. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the four giant gaseous planets that are farther out. Um, if you consider Pluto a planet, fine. Um, I'm not going to worry about that. But that's a, an ice ball. It would be all the way there on the right, and it would be so small you could barely see it. Pluto is actually much smaller than Earth's moon. I think that surprises people. Uh, it's a tiny, tiny world located very, very far away. And when you look at this, this, uh, this, this 
drawing, clearly Earth is not like these gas giants. Um, we have two different groups of planets. We have these gigantic ones and these littler ones. So in that sense, you can say, you know, when you look at the total mass of planets out there, the Earth is not special. Jupiter is actually the big guy. Uh, Jupiter has as much mass as all the other planets combined. Um, you could, if you could somehow put all of the planets into a into a, a food processor and pour them into Jupiter, they would all fit. Uh, so you know, Jupiter is 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 the big guy dominating the solar system. However, if we look at the other planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and say, is Earth special? Um, you kind of have to ask the question a little bit more specifically. Venus, same size as Earth, roughly the same mass, more or less the same stuff makes up Venus that makes up Earth. On the other hand, Venus is uh, 900 degree uh, surface temperature. Uh, the, the surface pressure is like being under, uh, I, I can't even remember, like a, like a half a mile of water, something like that. It's, a, it's an awful place. You don't want to be there. Mars is very cold and has uh, very little atmosphere. Mercury is too hot and has no atmosphere. So in that sense, yeah, Earth is kind of special. Um, so again, just in our neighborhood, how you answer that question depends on on what you mean, the specifics of is Earth special. It's special um, in, in certainly in one sense in that we have liquid water on the surface of our planet. Um, as far as we know, there is no liquid water on the surface of any other world in the solar system. But turns out we're not the only solar system. There are more of them. There are many, many, many more of them as we have come to learn. How have we learned this? Um, Astronomers have discovered well over 4,000 confirmed planets orbiting other stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and these are, these are actually all relatively close by. The galaxy is very large and we've only looked out a certain, a very small distance. So we haven't explored very much of it. Uh, and we're finding planets everywhere. And the question is, how are we finding planets? Well, the most successful method is what's called the transit method. And it's actually fairly straightforward. Let me, let me put this in motion. Ba -ba -da. On the left, you have a uh, drawing of a star and a planet orbiting it. If we see the orbit of that planet edge on, then at once every orbit, it passes directly in front of the star. And when it does that, you get a little mini eclipse and it blocks a little bit of the star's light. So on the right, if you have a telescope pointed at that star and you're measuring its brightness, when the planet passes in front, you see this gigantic, well, in this drawing, you see that big dip in the star's light because the planet is blocking the light. I'll keep this, keep this going here. There we go. Um, in reality, stars are very big and planets are very small. And so that, that drop in light that you see is typically a fraction of a percent. Usually it's measured in parts per thousand uh, and sometimes even less than that. Um, so you have to have big telescopes. You point them at stars. You take all these measurements over and over and over again. You can see that dip. Now, the beauty of this method Besides the fact that you're seeing a planet at all, this is, this is uh, the most successful method we have at, at finding planets orbiting other stars. Um, if you know how big the star is, by measuring that dip, you can measure how big the planet is. The bigger the planet, the deeper the dip. The smaller the planet, the shallower that dip is. And so if you know how big the star is, you can physically measure the size of the planet. And that, that right away can tell you something. If you measure... Um, the planet size, and you find out it's as big as Jupiter, it's probably not an Earth-like planet. If you measure the size and it's the size of the Earth, then maybe it's an Earth-like planet. You don't know. Uh, you just know its size. However, there are other things you can learn as well. For example, um, by the way, by the shape of this dip, it's not always just this nice little U-shape. Sometimes it's slanted a little bit. There are different, different aspects of it that can tell you things about the shape of the orbit of that planet. You can tell by how long it takes that planet to cross the star, the width of that dip in time. That tells you the orbit of that planet. If you know what kind of star it is, you know how long it takes that planet to go around, that tells you the distance the planet is to the star. This is all fairly basic physics um, that you can learn sort of in undergraduate physics and astronomy. So it's, it's not, that, not that complicated. If you can tell how far away your planet is from the star, you might be able to say, is it orbiting really close and super hot? Is it orbiting really far away and super cold? Or is it in a region where maybe it's, it's a temperate planet? I'll get to that in a minute. So you can learn quite a bit about sort of the general idea of what the planet is like. Um, 
And this is called the transit method. A transit is when one object passes in front of another. So an eclipse is a kind of transit. Well, there's another kind called the reflex velocity. Um, and this is, uh, these are two uh, animations. The one on the right shows you if we happen to see a star with a planet orbiting it, and we see that orbit edge on, you can see there the planet passes in front of the star, then goes behind it and passes in front of it and goes behind it. Um, if you, <clears throat> pardon me, it's been very dry today. Um, if you happen to see the orbit of that planet more face on, not edge on, but face on, um, you don't see any transits. Um, but you, you can see uh, what's happening here is that, sure, a planet orbits a star, but really, technically, they're both orbiting their center of mass, their center of gravity, if you want to think of it that way. Astronomers call this the Berry Center. Um, and that is actually very cool because if you have a planet orbiting a star and the star is making this little circle like that, you typically can't see that circle. The star is way too far away. The circle it's making is too small. And even with powerful telescopes, it's incredibly difficult. It's not impossible, but it's incredibly difficult to see that star's motion. But again, if you do see that planet's orbit edge on, you can see that star moving back and forth as the planet orbits. Well, as the planet is orbiting, sometimes that star is moving toward you and sometimes it's moving away, toward you and away. And if you look at that star with a telescope, you can actually measure its Doppler shift. And this is a, a, a shift in the color of its light. It's very, very subtle. You have to have very, uh, really nice telescopes to be able to see this. But this is the same thing that happens when you're standing outside and a motorcycle goes by, right? And it goes as it goes past you the sound as it's approaching you, the sound pitch goes up because the wavelengths are getting compressed if you want the physics of it. And when, you, when it passes, those wavelengths are getting stretched out and the pitch drops. And the same thing happens to light. If something is moving towards you, its light gets shifted to a shorter wavelength towards the blue end of the spectrum. And as it's moving away, its wavelengths get stretched out, move to the red end of the spectrum. That's why we call this a blue shift and a red shift. I am glossing over this hugely, and this is a lot more complicated than that, but the beauty of this is, this depends on the mass of the planet. And if, um, if the star is, if the mass of the planet is very big, it's pull, its gravity is pulling on the star very hard. And that star is really whipping around that circle. The star is, the star is making a bigger circle. If the planet's lower mass, the star makes a, a, a slower circle, or not a slower circle, excuse me, a smaller circle. This is good because if you can measure both uh, the planet size using the transit method and its mass using the reflex velocity method, you get its density, mass divided by volume, its density. That tells you super important thing. It tells you what the planet's made of. Planets aren't made of that many different things. You can kind of lump them into metal, like iron and nickel, rocky stuff, like this, you know, rocks out in your yard, and uh, uh, water and ice. Those are the kinds, the three kinds of things planets are made of. Uh, and, and if they have a very thick atmosphere, you can find that out too. Air doesn't, isn't very dense. You know, if you have, you know, this much air, it hardly weighs anything. If you have this much water, it's heavy. If you have this much rock, it's much heavier. If you have this much iron, you're not holding it like this. I'll tell you that much. You're going to be, you're going to be dropping that and, and causing an accident. The density of the object tells you what it's made of. Now, Jupiter, for example, is a gas giant. It's mostly atmosphere, very low density. Uh, the Earth, a lot of metal in its core, and so it's very high density. By, so by looking at these two methods, you can find out what your planet is like. You know, if, if, if it's mostly metal, if it's got rock, if it's got a thick atmosphere, without ever actually seeing the planet. You don't see it. You're seeing its effect on its star. You're learning a huge amount about it. Um, we have a telescope up right now called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, and it is staring at stars in the sky, measuring transits. Now, they have to be edge on, and, and they can be any orientation in, the, in space. So only a handful of, of planets are orbiting edge on from our viewpoint um, out of all these stars. <clears throat> but if you look at a lot of them, you'll see plenty of transits. And it's actually discovered quite a few planets so far. It's been up for a couple of years and it's doing a fantastic job. Oh, and I should say, ah, an earlier satellite was called Kepler. And um, this was a sort of a test mission to look at one spot in space 
at, at 150,000 stars and look for planets. And you'll be hearing that name over and over again because it found so many planets that most of the planets I'm gonna talk about here were discovered by Kepler. There's a third way. I just wanna talk about this because this is incredibly awesome. Um, you can see planets in some images. Um, for example, this is a Beta Pictoris. This is a, a star you can see from the Southern Hemisphere. A naked eye star, quite, you know, quite visible, quite bright. Um, we have suspected it's had planets since the 1980s for various reasons. The observations of it seem to indicate that it might have planets around it. It's a very young star. It's only a few million years old, which is quite young for, for a star. Uh, and then um, finally, my heavens, Colorado is very dry. Um, in, in <clears throat> it's cold, so we have the heater running, and so it's very dry in my house, and I apologize for this. Um, uh, in 2003, uh, that image in the upper left was taken. The star, by the way, is blocked out here. So it's kind of like, you know, if you're, you're trying to see an airplane in the sky or a cloud and you hold your hand up to block the sun, that's what this telescope does. It blocks the sun so fainter things can be seen. And um, yeah, there's this blob of light right next to the star. That is um, the first planet discovered orbiting Beta Pictoris, called Beta Pictoris B. Uh, and then um, six years later, in October 2009, the image in the upper right, its position in 2003 is labeled there in the upper left, but now you can see the planet's now at the lower right. Over those six years, that planet orbited the star, went around the back of the, the back of the star, I think. I don't think it went in front, um, and was now on the other side of the star. And it turns out that planet has an orbit pretty much like Saturn's, about that big. And so uh, it takes 20 years or so for it to go around the star. And um, as you observe it more and more, it's moving all the time. That last picture there at the bottom was taken in March 2010, just a few months after that other one. And you can see that it's moved a little bit even since then. Um, so you can actually see these planets moving. Um, here's another one. This is HR8799, you know, the random star in the sky, fairly decently bright star. Um, this one, again, the star itself is blocked out. You can see three planets there observed in um, 2004 and 2008. Um, and they're circled there. Not only that, a fourth star, a fourth planet was found. So there's B, C, D, and E. And I can show you them here. Uh, you can see the three bright ones there uh, lined up on the right, and off way off on the left is a fourth one. Um, this one's been observed long enough that we can actually see them going around the star. Check this out. Just that animation. See them moving counterclockwise. So this has taken over five, six, seven years, and you can see these planets moving. So we can actually observe these stars over and over and over again and get the planet's motions, measure their orbits, learn about the star and the planets that way. This typically, this method works best for young stars. The planets are still very hot, left over from their formation. And so they glow in the infrared. And for various reasons, observing the infrared is, is a lot easier to do this. Um, and so we've, we've got images of dozens of these planets now, but they are not Earth-like, okay? These are, um, these are planets that if, they, if they're Earth-sized, they're probably completely molten. And um, typically Earth-sized planets are very faint in this method. So the bright ones are probably more like Jupiter or even bigger. And they're, they're fiercely glowing and giving off a lot of infrared light. So these are not, not Earth-like planets. Now, finally, this concept um, is, is a very important one if you're talking about looking for planets like Earth. It's called the habitable zone. And you may have heard of this. Simply put, it's the distance a planet is from a star such that its temperature more or less allows liquid water to exist on its surface. So if you're too close to a star, it's too hot. If you're too far from a star, it's too cold. And so you've got, you know, water all boils if you're too close. Water all freezes if you're too far. So in this habitable zone, you're at the right distance from a star where it's at least possible for liquid water to exist on the surface. It is not a rule, right? The Earth is in the sun's habitable zone. Technically, so is Venus. And Venus, not to put too fine a point on it, is hell. It is so hot, so much pressure, carbon dioxide atmosphere, clouds made of sulfuric acid, okay? Venus is not a nice place, and yet it's in the habitable zone. It's because the habitable zone is, is, is more of a concept. It's just a, a guideline, if you will to say, if a planet's in there, then maybe it can have liquid water on its surface. Look at Mars. Mars has lots of water, actually, but it's all frozen because it has a very thin atmosphere. Even though it's in, technically in the sun's habitable zone, 
um, there's no liquid water on its surface because the air is too thin. If you could swap Mars and Venus, give Mars more of an atmosphere, maybe trade with Venus with atmosphere. Um, yeah, you could have three planets in the sun's habitable zone that could technically have liquid water on their surface. That's just not the way it worked out for us. Um, so in this case, looking at the solar system, again, asking if the earth is special, the answer is yes, because it's in the right spot near the sun, well, I should say not too close, not too far, uh, has, a, has an atmosphere that supports there being liquid water on the surface. Um, if this whole not too hot, not too cold thing sounds familiar, you may remember the tale of Goldilocks. Uh, and in fact, for a long time, people would refer to this as the Goldilocks zone. Um, and that used to crack me up because I mean, I just always wanted to tell these astronomers calling it Goldilocks zone. It's like, did you did you pay attention to the story? Because Goldilocks is is like, here's this cabin. I'm just gonna walk into this cabin and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna take, oh, this porridge is too hot. Oh, this is too cold. Oh, but this is just right. I'm gonna eat it. Um, she's not uh not a nice person. And in fact, you know, the calling it the Goldilocks zone doesn't make sense. Really what it should be is the baby bear zone. And I don't know if that name's gonna stick, but you know, that technically is what we should call it. But habitable zone makes more sense. So the size of a habitable zone depends on the kind of star. If you're a very hot star, like at the top here, the habitable zone is actually very, very wide, um, but it's farther out from the star than the one for the sun. If you have a sun-like star, it extends from, I don't know, 60 to, you know, 200 or 150 million miles, I don't know, something like that. But for a hot star, it starts farther out, but it extends for a much larger range. For a cooler star, it's actually much closer to the star and much narrower. Um, so if you have, say, a red dwarf, which is sort of a dim, small star, um, if it has planets orbiting much closer to it than even Mercury orbits the sun, because the star is cooler, you have to be closer to it to stay warm. So its habitable zone is much closer in. So the question is, have we found, out of these 4,000 planets, have we found planets in the habitable zones of their stars? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Now this, this, this diagram, um, ooh, it's several years old now. Um, and um, I could add many, many, many more planets to this now. Now these are all drawings, uh, it's just representative. But when you look at stars like the sun, what we call G stars, they're just stars very much like the sun, we actually know of quite a few planets orbiting in the habitable zones of those kinds of stars. Earth, obviously, is one of them. Um, also, Kepler-452 is a star that has a planet, Kepler-452b, that orbits in its habitable zone. We happen to also know that this planet is much larger than Earth. Um, K stars are a little bit cooler. They're kind of orangey stars. Uh, and we found plenty. You can see there's, you know, Kepler 62f and 235e and all these planets that we have found orbiting K stars. Yeah, in the habitable zone. And it turns out, and I honestly did not expect this to happen when we first started finding planets, that M stars, these red dwarf planets, uh, excuse me, these red dwarf stars, these are tiny stars, you know, a quarter to a half the size of the sun. Um, a quarter the temperature of the sun and incredibly feeble. They, they glow at like 1% of how bright the sun is. Um, and yet there are planets in the habitable zones of these tiny feeble stars. They're orbiting very close into the star. When you hear the numbers, they're like, you know, 5 million miles from the star, why doesn't it cook? And it's like, well, it's a cooler star. So it doesn't heat as well and those planets could be habitable. And it turns out we have found planetary systems like this. Uh, where there are multiple planets in the habitable zones of their star. Now, here's the thing. Look at this diagram. Um, these planets are drawn to scale, as far as we know, the sizes of these planets. And you can see they're all bigger than Earth. Uh, and it turns out there's a problem here with finding planets. Um, oh, excuse me, I'll get to that in a sec. Uh, these are, this is just to show you a sort of a, a scale of planets that we have found orbiting some of these stars in their habitable zone. And again, they are all much uh, from somewhat too much larger than the Earth. And we've even found gas giants orbiting in their stars' habitable zones. Um, you can't live on a gas giant, there's no surface. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, if you wanna live there in a balloon, go for it. Uh, the atmospheres are typically poisonous though, hydrogen, helium, methane, ammonia, you don't wanna live there. Um, but foreshadowing. I'll get back to that as well. There may be a way out of that. So there's a problem looking for planets. We find them using the transit method. The problem with the transit method is that the bigger the planet, 
the easier it is to find. The bigger the planet, the more of the star it blocks, the bigger the dip and the easier it is to see. And so there's, a, there's what we call a bias, a selection effect. And that is, if we, if we look at these stars, we're more likely to find the bigger planets because they're easier to spot. So what happens when we plot, and, and this is the only, the only graph I'm gonna show you, so don't sweat it. And this one's actually relatively easy to understand. It's a bar graph. Planets on the left are small and they get bigger going to the right. So all the way on the right are planets that are bigger than Jupiter. All the way on the left are ones that are Mars and smaller. And in the middle are, are, are planets in between. And the more of them we have found, the taller the bar. So we have not found, found very many Mars-sized planets. And again, this is, oh gosh, this graph is five years old. I've never been able to find a, a graph like this that's more up to date. But this, this, this shows you pretty much what's going on. We don't find very many small planets. They're hard to find. They could be, they could be lot, there could be lots of them out there, but because they're so small, they're harder to find, and so we don't see so many. Look over on the right, the super Jupiter and Jupiter-sized planets. These are the easiest ones to find, and yet they are not the most common ones that we have found. The most common ones are those two in the middle. These are ones that are super Earths between one and two times the size of the Earth, roughly, and mini Neptunes, ones which are closer to Neptune in size. Neptune something like four and a half times wider than the Earth. Once you start to get about twice the, the size of the Earth, the gravity of the planet is strong enough that it really draw in a lot of gas when it's forming. And so there's like this, this tipping point, this critical point where as the planet gets bigger, it suddenly goes from being something that's more like the Earth to just being something that's more like Neptune. And that dividing line is right around two times the size of the Earth. So we got those two bar graphs there. Those are clearly by far, and this is still true today, the most common kind of planet we've discovered in the galaxy. When we look at all these stars, um, you know, by, by quite a bit, these super Earth mini Neptunes are the ones we're finding the most common, most commonly. And that brings me back to the title of this talk, the subtitle of this talk, Is Earth Special? Well, when you look at all the planets that we have discovered orbiting other stars, the answer is kind of yes, right? We don't, the Earth is not in the bin of the most common kind of planet we find. So Earths are fairly rare. Uh, they're, 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 we, we find fewer of them than Neptune-sized planets, for example, uh, when we look. Uh, and so, um, yeah, maybe finding small rocky planets like Earth is the exception and not the rule. And in fact, what's interesting in our solar system, there are no super Earths or mini Neptunes, uh, none that we found at least. There's this idea of planet nine, this, this planet orbiting way out past, uh, past Neptune. Astronomers are arguing about whether it exists or not right now and they're looking for it. Um, if it exists, it is probably a mini Neptune, um, probably. Uh, and so we'll see. But as far as we know, the sun doesn't even have one of the most common kind of planets in the, in the galaxy. So that's interesting. Um, well, so I've been talking this whole time about the habitable zone uh, and, and you know, Earth being in the sun's habitable zone. We are finding planets in the habitable zone, but most of the planets we find are not. They tend to be closer to the star uh, and they're very hot. Those are the easiest kind of planets to find, but still the Earth is small and rare. It's in the sun's habitable zone, which is not as common as planets that aren't in it. But it makes me wonder, was Goldilocks too picky? Well, the answer of course is yes. We know from the fable she was. Um, she's kind of a jerk, honestly. Um, but maybe we need to widen our, our, uh, uh, our borders a little bit and say, you know, does an Earth-like planet have to be in the habitable zone of a star? And it turns out that not only is the answer no, but there could be potentially habitable worlds in our own solar system that aren't Earth and that aren't in the sun's habitable zone. And this is a picture of Jupiter. Uh, and you can see two of its moons in front of it. On the right is uh, Io, the volcanic moon. And on the left is Europa, that sort of white and tannish moon. Europa is a very interesting world. This is a close-up picture of it, taken, I believe, by the Galileo space probe. It's a mosaic of many images put together. And when you look at it, it's, that's weird, right? It's mostly white, which is ice. And it's got that weird reddish stuff all over it. And that reddish stuff, is uh, made up of um, organic molecules. These are carbon-based molecules. They're not, it's not from life, but we call anything that's sort of carbon, any molecule that has a lot of carbon in it, carbon-based organic molecules. 
And you can see all those cracks all over it. Not only that, if you compare this moon to ours, you can see right away, one thing you notice is there, there are very few craters on Europa. It's just as old as our moon, it has very few craters. Why? And it turns out it's because it's covered in ice. And well, let me, let me, let me put that aside for a second and say, the reason it doesn't have very many craters is because we think it has a subsurface ocean. Now, Jupiter is five times farther out from the sun than the Earth is. The, the temperatures there are incredibly cold. Water is frozen solid if it's, if it's just sitting there like the surface of Europa. But underneath that shell of ice, we think, is a very large ocean that's probably uh, salt water. Uh, and that's because Europa is heated by Jupiter. As Europa orbits Jupiter, it, there's a complex relationship going on between the moon and the planet, but Europa is getting stretched and squeezed and stretched and squeezed. And the friction that that generates inside the moon warms it up. And so inside of it, it's warm enough for water to exist as a liquid. Uh, and we think that that's why it doesn't have any craters on it. Um, the surface of Europa is young, that if some, some asteroid comes in and smacks into it, uh, eventually water will seep up and fill that crater. The, there's water con continually seeping up onto the surface and repaving it, basically. So all the potholes are gone. Um, and that becomes an interesting thing to look for. If you see an icy moon where the surface is relatively smooth, uh, that may mean that the surface is young, it's being repaved, and that means it has a liquid ocean surface or underwater. And in fact, if you live in a cold, cold climate, and um, I know, you know, Washington, Seattle gets cold. Um, I don't think it gets cold enough to freeze lakes, does it? Or very often? I see people, yeah, shaking their heads. No. Okay, good. I live in Colorado, and let me tell you something. Yeah, plenty cold to freeze lakes. Uh, and so the surface of Europa looks very much like a lake that's been frozen. You get these sort of cracked patterns in it and segments and, 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 uh, po uh, polygon shapes and everything. And I, I just remember when I moved to Colorado and seeing the lake frozen, I thought, oh my God, that looks like Europa. It also looks like Enceladus, which is another moon. This is orbiting Saturn. Again, another icy moon. And you do see craters on it on, on sort of the top there, but on the left, you don't see as many. And that's because again, uh, we think Enceladus has an undersurface ocean of water uh, and some of that leaks up and has repaved the surface there. Now look at the bottom, you see those blue stripes, those blue parallel stripes? Those are called the tiger stripes, not because tigers are striped, I think, but because it looks like a tiger has clawed the, the moon with its, with its claws. Those are actually cracks in the surface that lead down to the liquid water ocean. How do we know this? We know this because of this image. This was taken by Cassini, the uh, spacecraft that orbited Saturn for 13 years, passed by Enceladus many, many times. And at one point, this was not, I don't think this was the discovery image, but this is a, a good example. At one point, the sun was on the other side of Enceladus. Uh, Cassini was looking down on the dark side of it and backlit by the sun, you see those gigantic rays of light coming out of Enceladus. But that's not light, those are geysers. Those are, those are beams of water, like fire hoses of water being shot out from the surface because of the pressure of that ocean underneath the surface. There are cracks in the surface that are cracked open because again of the, the gravity of Saturn has cracked the moon. And the, the water just shoots out right into space. Uh, incredible. This is a, a small moon. I want to say it's 300 miles across. It's not terribly big. So it doesn't have a lot of gravity and it's easy for that water to shoot out into space. And um, sure enough, Cassini flew through these plumes and not only uh, showed that, yeah, these are water, but also they have um, all kinds of organic compounds in them. Uh, not exactly sure what, but a lot of carbon-based molecules. So that's pretty interesting, right? You've got probably cold water, but liquid water underneath the surface of these moons. Um, it's probably salt water because of the way we think they interact with the rocky cores of these moons. Um, and in Enceladus, we have evidence that they have complex carbon chemistry going on inside of it. It's like, these are the ingredients of life. The sun does not shine in, in these moons. It's very, very dark in these oceans, pitch black. There's no sunlight. And yet there's still an energy source from, this, from the heat from the interior. There's water, there's chemistry. Uh, could there be life inside of these moons? And the answer is maybe, you know, we can't say, but you know, the ingredients are there. 
and and they've had four billion years just like we have. So who knows? We would really like to send some probes to these moons and find out. <clears throat> and again, mind you, on the surface of, of Enceladus, it's so cold that water is frozen into, into ice that's harder than granite is on Earth. So, uh, you know, it's only on deep down that it gets warm enough to, to see uh, liquid water. So this is nowhere near the habitable zone, not even close. All right. What about other moons? This is uh, Rhea. That's another moon of Saturn. Titania, moon of uh, Neptune. Neptune's moons are all named after... Um, uh, uh, Shakespeare's characters in Midsummer Night's Dream. Oberon, Triton, a gigantic moon orbiting Neptune. It's actually uh, bigger than Pluto. Eris and Sedna, which are two ice balls orbiting the sun way out past Neptune. We have, again, reason to believe that all of these moons may have, if not subsurface oceans, subsurface lakes. And Pluto itself, um, that heart-shaped region, um, there's evidence of, of slushy convection, of hot liquid rising and, and, and falling as it cools. And by hot, you know, I don't mean hot. I mean, it's still extremely cold. But again, there could be a subsurface water ocean on Pluto, under Pluto. Um, wait, we've been talking about water and we've been talking about the habitable zone. Let's open up our borders a little bit more. Do we need water? Titan is, that, is a gigantic moon of Saturn. It's bigger than Mercury. And you can see a picture of it there. Saturn's rings are red on there. You see the shadow of the rings on the planet. And that's, oops, that's Titan. Cassini passed over Titan several times and used it. Titan has an atmosphere. It's a very thick atmosphere of, of nitrogen, just like Earth's. It's actually denser than Earth's atmosphere. And it, it's, it's opaque. And so uh, Cassini had radar and it would uh, sweep over the moon to, um, to use radar to bounce off the surface. And, and the idea being that if it, if it hits a mountain, it doesn't take as much time for the radar to go down to that mountaintop and bounce back as it does to hit the ground and bounce back. And so by timing your pulses, you can actually get a topography, you know, hills and valleys and such. And it found these regions near the North Poles that look like this. You know, they, they're, where you see black, it doesn't reflect radar. Well, what doesn't reflect radar? Liquid. Liquid absorbs radar. Uh, water is way too, it's way too cold to have liquid water there. So we think that what you're looking at here is a lake of liquid methane. And look at, look at the bottom there. Look at the tributaries and rivers that flow into it. And on Titan, Titan has a methane cycle. It actually exists as a liquid in these lakes, evaporates and forms clouds, rains down, and then flows back into these lakes. Again, exactly one of the reasons we think Earth has life. It's because that water cycle. Titan has the same thing. So could it have life? Don't know. Okay, let's try again. What about Mars? Well, look at Mars now. It's dry and cold, doesn't have any air. Four billion years ago, very different story. Uh, Mars was warmer, had a thicker atmosphere, and um, possibly had lots of water. As a matter of fact, we know it had a lot of water. If you read my blog tomorrow, go to scifiwire.com slash badastronomy. Um, I will have an article talking about ancient Mars. All the water on Mars is either frozen in the, in the ice caps, frozen below the surface, or just gone. We know it had a lot more water in the past. It lost most of its water. We kind of have an understanding of how, but I won't get into that. But the point is, four billion years ago, um, it, four billion years ago, it looked more like Earth does now than Earth did four billion years ago. We didn't have this nice oxygen atmosphere that we can breathe. We didn't have water on the surface like we do now. Um, not exactly. Uh, and so... Uh, if you look in the past, if you don't, don't sort of constrain yourself to looking for planets that are habitable now, Mars was perfectly habitable a long time ago. Uh, and so again, you know, that whole idea of a habitable zone and liquid water, we need to be a little bit, a little bit uh, broader with our, with our thinking about this. So again, there's the Earth. I love this picture. This is the Earthrise picture taken by Apollo 8. Uh, and you can see there, I think that's Australia again, the Pacific Ocean. You can see the, uh, the blue and the white and with the moon in the foreground, it's gray and dead, and the Earth is just vibrant and alive. Um, when you seeing it in the black of space like that, it's a planet. You know, we think of it as our home, but really, it's a planet among what may be billions of planets in our galaxy. We've only found a few thousand, but we've only looked at a few thousand stars. Uh, there are billions of planets out there orbiting other stars. There are billions of planets that are the same size as Earth. There are billions of planets the same size as Earth orbiting in their star's habitable zone. And, that, and we know that water is abundant in space. There could be lots and lots and lots of Earths out there. Um, 
compared to all the huge numbers of planets, maybe a small fraction. Earth may be special by sheer number, um, by composition, by size, by uh, by where it is near the star. It may be special in all these ways. But on the other hand, it's not terribly special because we know that there's other kinds of chemistry and other, other kinds of worlds that may be able to support life. And this is my absolute all-time favorite picture of Earth ever taken, taken by the Rosetta probe, the one that went to the comet and orbited the comet for a couple of years, the one that looked like a rubber ducky and took all those amazing pictures. It flew by Earth and took this picture. And we don't see Earth like this much. It's a crescent Earth. And it looks like a crescent moon, or if you've ever seen Venus or Mercury through a telescope and they're a crescent. This again drives home <laughs> the idea that the earth is a planet, it's a world. And it is, it's, it's watery and it's warm and we have evolved to, to, to inhabit it. The earth is not adapted to us, we have adapted to it. If it were a little bit different, there were a little bit more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, a little bit less, whatever. Life would have probably adapted to that. So here, here we are now adapted to this earth. But nowadays, if we change things a little bit, earth isn't habitable. I live at 5,000 feet. And let me tell you something. When I go up to 10,000 feet, I have a hard time breathing. If you go up to 20,000 feet, you need to bring oxygen with you. You can't survive on every place on earth. You can't survive at the bottom of the ocean or at the poles or in the middle of the Sahara Desert. So even the earth is... is, is there are special places on it. Uh, and that again, this, this really, to see it as a planet among all these other planets that are so different and so similar, some of them heartbreakingly close to Earth. But the point is, as far as we know, we have not found a planet exactly like Earth. And because we have evolved, life has evolved for billions of years to adapt to Earth's conditions, that to me is probably the best way to ask, is Earth special? And the answer is, Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh. How'd I do on time? Oh, fantastic. Did I oh, run long? Goodness. When did I start? Was that a half an hour talk or an hour and a half talk? You know, these days, who knows? You did great <laughs> though. We're right on, we're right on schedule. Um, uh, thank you so much. That, that animation gets me every time. I, I, I like of the plants really, moving around the stars. Yeah. When you did that in rehearse the, the little run through, that was, I can't, I can't believe we have essentially video footage of another solar system. So that, yeah, that's, yeah, it's incredible. And we have more than that now that, 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 that animation is a couple of years old now. Yeah. That's great. Oh. Um, and then, uh, yeah, feel free to unshare. And then, uh, yeah, Stephanie will go. be navigating the uh, Q&A. Stephanie? Yeah. yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Excellent talk. And just as a reminder to everybody uh, in the webinar, you can type your questions into the Q&A and I will ask them to fill. And Thanks. we're going to start out with uh, Bella, who asks, is the sun dying? <laughs> um, I can answer that a couple of ways. Um, it depends on what you mean. Um, you know, are, are you worried? Um, I would not be worried. Uh, the sun has been around for about four and a half billion years, and it's going to be about another seven billion years before it starts to run out of fuel. Hydro it's fusing hydrogen into helium in its core, and that's how it's generating all this heat. It's what makes it a star. It'll be able to do that for billions of more years. Eventually, it'll run out, and through a complicated series of processes, it's going to swell up into a red giant. It's going to eat Mercury and Venus. They're actually going to be consumed by the sun because it's going to expand out so much that they'll actually be inside the sun. The Earth will escape, we think. Um, not that that's a big deal for us because, first of all, seven billion years in the future, but also um, the Earth will still be so, the sun will be so big that the Earth will be orbiting just outside of it. And it's still going to be very hot several thousand degrees. So imagine the sky is filled with an oven that's several thousand degrees. Uh, the Earth is going to melt. Uh, when that happens. Uh, and in fact, if you even go out to where Jupiter and Saturn are, it's still going to be fairly warm. Um, but that's not going to happen for a long, long, long time. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, and uh, I guess I guess if you think that the Earth is, the sun is four and a half billion years old, we've got seven billion to go, it's kind of approaching middle age. So um, I am past, you know, technically past middle age, median, median. So, you know, I don't consider myself dying. Uh, and so if I, you know, before middle age, certainly not at all. So the sun's still got a long way to go. 
forgot to unmute myself. Thank you. Ah. Um, <laughs> David has a few questions sort of on uh, nomenclature and taxonomy of exoplanets. Uh, he wonders, what is your opinion on the word planet not having any meaning, meaning without a descriptive adjective in front, like ice giant or dwarf, for example? Right. And then also um, your opinion on naming exoplanets without actually having seen them from orbit. Ah, perfect. Um, sorry, just pulling up a, a prop. Um, I, the word planet is difficult to define. And um, it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you, I know one when I see one, but it turns out it's not that simple. Um, and a, a good, I, I always had a problem with this. I knew I didn't like the definition, trying to define what planet is. And, and I've, I've done this in, with, with audiences before where I say, um, how do you define planet? Give me something that you think would define a planet. And somebody would say, it's round, it has a moon, it does this, it does that. And for every, every rule they would come up with, I could think of a counterexample. Either something that, that is a planet under that rule, but really maybe shouldn't be, or something that isn't a planet under that rule, it maybe should be. And it, um, it turns out that it's kind of like the word continent. There's no real definition for continent. I mean, there kind of is. But uh, the question is, is Australia a continent? And the answer is kind of, yes, no, maybe. Uh, depends on what you mean. And so uh, Mike Brown, who is an astronomer, uh, and he's the one who uh, uh, discovered um, uh, Sedna. Sedna or Eris? Maybe both. I can't remember. But the one that started this whole idea of, you know, whether we call Pluto a planet or not. He's got a book called How I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming by, uh, oops, by Mike Brown. There you go. This is an excellent book. Uh, it's really fun to read. It talks about how, how they found all these objects orbiting out there past Neptune. And the very end of the book, he talks about, you know, how do we define what planet is? And he talks about this continent thing. And he, he, he says it so beautifully. He says that the word planet is a concept. It's not a definition. It's a concept. Life is the same thing. You know, we have an idea of what life is, but as soon as you try to make a hard and fast rule about what life is and what isn't, you start running into problems. You know, are viruses alive? You know, they, they, if you make a list of what makes things alive, viruses kind of sort of un, uh, fill out all those things, but not really. Uh, and, and, and if you take a step back from viruses and look at something a little bit simpler, um, why does that not, you know, if you think viruses are alive, but here's the thing that's just a wee bit simpler. Why is this not alive, but viruses are, right? You're trying to draw a line in the sand that nature does not draw. And we see this all the time, right? We think of the, the colors of the rainbow are the colors of light, but there's no, there's no real definition between what's red and what's orange, what's orange and what's yellow. Uh, and there's infrared and ultraviolet colors we can't even see. So as soon as you start to draw a line, where nature doesn't, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, and I feel that way about planet. Is Pluto a planet? Maybe. Um, you know, it's it's big and it's round. It's got moons, but it you know it doesn't. It's not a planet the way Jupiter is a planet. These are wildly different objects, uh, and yet you know we call them both planets. And it's like, well, you know, maybe we should have different words for these. Uh, and I've seen arguments back and forth, and it it it. 99% of the time when people are arguing whether Pluto is a planet or not, they're arguing the wrong question. It's like asking how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It's like, you're, this is a question that you cannot answer because you're asking the wrong question. The right question is, what is a planet and does it matter? Uh, is there a physical reason for Pluto to be lumped in with Earth? Or does it make more sense to lump it in with all these other icy objects out past Neptune? And it may depend on what you're talking about. It may be the question you're asking. And you see this, and I could go on and on about this. I should probably just write a whole lecture about this. Because there's, there's a type of object called a brown dwarf. And people call them failed stars. They're objects that don't have enough mass to become stars. But they're bigger than planets. And I tell people, why would you call it a failed star? It may be a very successful planet. Um, and And... It has star-like qualities and it has planet-like qualities, but it's not a star and it's not a planet. So you've got to be very careful. You don't want to draw lines, again, that nature doesn't draw. So that's how I feel about planets, about the word planet. And what about naming uh, the exoplanets without having seen them from orbit? Well, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, 
we give them designations. I mean, we, you know, I will say the name of this planet is Beta Pictoris B. That's not really true, right? It's kind of a catalog designation. It's, and so we should say we designated this. Um, some, some planets, some exoplanets have been given names. I'm not thrilled with that, um, mostly because there are 4,000 planets right now. Uh, and, and we could, we have the technology right now to discover millions of planets. If we, if we said, we want to take a census of a lot of planets, we could build a space telescope that's dedicated that goes out there and observes these stars and finds hundreds of thousands of planets, if not millions. Um, we're going to run out of names real fast. Uh, and it's hard enough naming features on other planets. Um, uh, you, you start running out of people's names, you start running out of mythological beings and everything. So I, I can't remember what some of the planet names are. Um, we did discover a planet around 40 Eridani, which is in Star Trek, Spock's, Spock's system. Uh, and so I'm all for naming that planet Vulcan. It's not a habitable planet. It's a gas giant uh, and it's way too hot. But calling it Vulcan, I'm fine with that, right? But you know, at, at some point we're going to run out of names. So I, I don't like the idea of giving them proper names right now. I think they should be given designations. And then someday maybe if we can go to them, if we build warp drive or whatever, eh, we can give them proper names then. But until then, seems kind of seems kind of the wrong way to go. Russ wants to know, uh, how do they detect multiple planets with the transit method? Um, that's a good question. Uh, in fact, it's you just see more transits. Um, what happens is if you have planets that are different sizes, the, the dip that you see will be a different depth. So a big planet, you get a big dip and a little planet, you get a little dip. And you, so if, if you see a big dip and it's happening um, at a very specific uh, time interval, you know, every, every 3.14 days, you see this big dip, then you know you've got a big planet orbiting that star every 3.14 days. But maybe you see a smaller dip every 7.2 days. And you say, ah, that's a different planet. That's a smaller planet orbiting farther out, takes a week to go around that star. And, and so you can see that. Um, it gets complicated because you're just observing this star and, and plotting these dots on the, on the graph, right? And so you see these dips and you have to figure out which ones are which. And that we've, we found planets, systems that have seven planets. And I wanna say we found one that has nine. I, I'm pretty sure there's one that's eight. And there's so many, so many transits, it can be hard to tell. Now there's this one star, Trappist-1, it's a red dwarf. It's a, one of these cool stars. Um, pretty close to the sun. I can't remember the distance, but it's, you know, dozens of light years. It's not thousands. It's actually really close to us. And it has seven Earth-sized planets orbiting it. They, these, these dips that we see are all about the same depth. And so keeping those straight is difficult, but there are mathematical processes you can do to look to, to sort of um, take that plot of all these dips and, and cut it up into little pieces and plot them over each other and see if you're, if you know, which cycle, which, what cycles you can get out of those. Um, can't remember what the technique is called and I've used it. Urgh! It was a long time ago though. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, so you just see lots of patterns of dips and you can figure out that there are multiple planets orbiting. Very cool. Is that, is it maybe convolution? Is that what you're thinking? No, or, it's, it's, uh... um, something folding. It's not phase, maybe it's phase folding. It's okay. just, I love all these terms. They're just so cool. They sound like something somebody might say in, you know, Doctor Who or Star Trek or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's basically what it is. You just, you just plot all these dips and you start to look at, at what periods you can find and, and, and how, how firm the, 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 the periods are and you can declare whether you have planets or not there. It's very, very complicated. Cool. Uh, Deanna asks, how do you determine the age of a star? Oh, um, there are actually lots of ways. Um, for example, stars, when stars are born, um, they tend to spin very rapidly uh, it, because you get a gas cloud that collapses to form a star. And you know, if you ever, you ever watch figure skating, and this is the, the very, 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 very cliched analogy, but if a figure skater is spinning on the ice with their arms out and they bring their arms in, they start to spin faster. Um, that's just a law of physics that, that if you take an object and make it smaller, it'll start to spin faster. Uh, and so as all this, as this cloud collapses, the cloud is spinning, when it forms that star, that star is, is rotating very rapidly. Over time, over billions of years, there are processes that slow that down. So the sun probably, you know, spun once a day when it was born. Now it spins once a month. It's slowed down over time. And so you can sort of look at a star and say, oh, it's rotating quickly, it must be young. Or it's rotating slowly, it must be old. 
And that just gives you at least an idea. Um, Stars that are very old were born when the universe was young and there weren't a lot of heavy elements. Stars have to make calcium and iron and molybdenum and all these weird heavy elements. And that takes time. And as, as the universe gets older, more and more of these elements are out there. So by looking at, at, the, at the composition of a star, which we can do, and you can say, oh, look, it has this much iron and it has this much calcium. That means it's a very young star or a very old one. And you can, there are other ways of doing this as well. Um, very complicated ways, that honestly, I don't understand. Uh, I've just never studied them. Um, that can actually tell you it to, to within decent, you know, you can say this star is 40 million years old, plus or minus 10 million years. That's, that's pretty good uh, to be able to say that. And we can, we, can, we can, in fact, say that about a lot of stars. I hope that helps. David mentions that there is a new study um, that claims that Earth was a water world with no continents very early on. Do you have any comment on that? I have not read that, so I don't know. Um, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I mean, it would, it would be like, oh, neat. That is a surprise. It, but it's not shocking. I mean, if you, if you look at these maps of the Earth without water, um, you can see that you know, where the ocean is, the oceans are deep. They're, you know, four miles deep, whatever. Uh, and the highest point on earth is five miles high. So, you know, if we had three times as much water in the past as on, on earth's surface as we do now, yeah, the earth would be inundated. And in fact, we're seeing that because of climate change, the, the, the ice caps are melting, the, the Arctic and Antarctic and Greenland, these, this is the three biggest warehouses of, of ice on the planet. If those all melted, sea level would go way up. And instead of being a 70% covered in water, we'd be 90% covered in water or something like that. I don't know. Um, plus, you know, the Rocky Mountains, for example, um, are young. These are only, you know, tens of millions of years old compared to billions of years for the earth. So uh, uh, the earth land rises and falls and all that. So yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me if if uh, the ocean levels have, have gone way up and way down over, over the 4 billion year history of our planet. That's really cool though. If, you know, I'll, I'll have to make a note of that. Oh. Old, old school uh, water, water earth. There, I'll take a look at that. Thank yeah, you. I had to That's Google neat. it. It looks like a very new study. I just found it on the AAAS uh, website, but I haven't had oh, a cool. chance to read okay. it yet. And um, I should mention, you know, since I said it, you can find these maps of the earth without water and they'll show like the dry earth and there's a water drop next to it to say, if we collected all of earth's water, this is how much it is. Some of them show Europa and Enceladus, how much water we think is in those moons. Europa may actually have more liquid water than earth does because it's because that ocean is so deep. Uh, even though it's a tiny moon, it's much smaller than the earth. So much of it is liquid and the earth really doesn't have that much liquid water, you know, comparatively. Yeah, Europa may have more water in it than earth does on it. The universe Tabitha, is weird, man. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, Tabitha is asking, um, and I'm not quite sure the phrasing here, but uh, cold faithful responsible for the outermost ring of Saturn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there is a ring of Saturn. The G ring? I can't remember. And I should because I was just writing about Saturn's rings a couple of weeks ago. Um, maybe due to... Um, uh, these, these geysers erupting on Enceladus, this water is just going out into space. It can escape Enceladus, but it can't escape Saturn. Saturn's gravity is much uh, stronger. And so that this water just goes into orbit around Enceladus and there's, or around Saturn, I mean. And in fact, you can see there's a great Cassini image of when Cassini was way back from Saturn looking back. And you can see this sort of ring, glowing ring with Enceladus embedded in it. And you can actually see that. Uh, so that may be, it may be that, yeah, that, that ring was caused by, uh, one of many of Saturn's rings was caused by these geysers erupting off of Enceladus. Incredible. Um, we have uh, a question with a disclaimer. It's a science teacher. Uh, uh -oh. Aren't factors like radioactive, uh, radioactive material in the interior and magnetic fields important for supporting life? We think so. Now, now here again, we're talking about a planet like Earth, not Europa or Enceladus. But um, for example, I said Mars had lost all its water. We think, 
that um, part of the reason uh, that this happened is that because Mars is smaller, it cooled more rapidly than Earth did. Its core was smaller and it cooled more rapidly. Now the core of a planet with all the iron in it, um, if it has liquid, if it's hot, the, the iron is a liquid. And as that core spins, it generates a magnetic field. And that's what generates the Earth's magnetic field. Mm, it's more complicated than this, duh. But you know, in a nutshell, that's what's going on. Um, with Mars, uh, because the core cooled and solidified, it lost its magnetic field. Well, the magnetic field is what protects us from the solar wind. The sun is shooting out these charged particles all the time. And the Earth's magnetic field acts like a buffer. It, it collects them, basically, and prevents them from uh, continuously slamming into the atmosphere. Mars didn't have that. Its magnetic field shut down billions of years ago. And so the solar wind just basically sandblasted away its atmosphere. Once its atmosphere went away, uh, the, the water on the surface would have boiled and been lost to space. And it turns out now a new study has just come out that I don't think is embargoed. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be talking about it. Um, that I will just say that the water may have gone someplace else. I wanna be careful here. Uh, 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 in fact, I'm, like I said, I'm writing about this on my blog tomorrow, um, but Mars's water disappeared. And so, yeah, um, if you don't keep your core hot and have a magnetic field, you may, you may lose your habitability on the surface. And in fact, one reason the Earth's core is still hot is that it's bigger than Mars's was, but also we have a lot of radioactive elements in there that are heating it up. As these things decay, they generate heat and that keeps the core hot. They're actually, um, the, Earth, the Earth's core is still hot because radioactivity, because of, of heavy stuff sinking through the mantle, that actually heats it up very slowly, keeps, keeps the Earth's core hot. And um, there's leftover heat from its formation. Uh, basically, the Earth's crust is insulating all that heat. And so the Earth was very, very hot when it formed four billion years ago. It is still hot from that. And because that heat can't escape to space very, space very efficiently. Um, and so, you know, you may need all of these things. Um, uh, the hot inner Earth keeps, um, keeps continental drift, keeps the continents moving around the Earth. And that is constantly resurfacing the Earth, um, making sure that water gets recycled. All these things are happening. And we think this all may be important for life, but we don't know because we don't know we only have one example, A, of life, and B, of a planet that's like Earth, and that's us. So, you know, once we start to explore these other Earth-like planets that we're discovering, Earth-sized planets we're discovering, maybe we'll find out just how important that stuff is. Don't know. Excellent. Um, I think this is a pretty great question. How does the direct imaging method block out a star's light? Um, you know what? It blocks out literally the way I said. Um, like, like there's a light right here, and if I actually this one's this one's brighter. If I if I hold my hand in front of that light, you can see my shadow of my hand on my face right here. Um, inside the telescope is it, you. Sometimes it's a disc of metal. Sometimes it's a bar. Um, but it literally blocks the light from the star. You put the star behind that 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 what's called an occulting bar or an occulting mask. Occulting is when one object blocks another object. So sometimes you'll see the moon occult Mars. It literally passes in front of Mars. Um, so it's called an occulting mask, occulting bar, and you're blocking the star's light. And you, you make that, you know, you make that metal strip really thin, you put the star behind it, and then um, you reduce the glare from that star in your telescope. And so on either side of that bar, you can see much fainter objects. Um, I worked on a camera on Hubble called STIS, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. And we had a couple of these occulting bars in our camera and we could, we could put a star behind them. And in fact, um, in the 19, let's see, we launched in 97 and we had already discovered many planets by then, but we didn't really know how planets formed very well. We had a pretty good idea, but if you take a young star that's still forming and put it behind that occulting bar, all of the swirling gas that it's forming from, you could see it around the star. And it was the first time we had gotten really nice, high resolution, detailed images of these things. And so I got to work on that project for a while. I was just a peon on it. There were other grown-ups working on it, but I was, you know, working on the data. And every time we got a new observation, I just like would dive into it because I knew I'd be the first person to see all this stuff. And it was just so gorgeous to see that. So that's a, a very standard method. And there are other ones, very sophisticated ways of reducing the stars. Like as a star is a billion, with a B, a billion times brighter than a planet, typically. 
and, and so you really want to block as much light as possible. And there are a lot of different ways of doing that to sort of maximize the planet's brightness and minimize the stars so that you can see that planet above the glare. It works. We're getting good at this. <laughs> We've got a lot, of, a lot of images of planets like that. Cool. Um, we have time for one more question. And I'm, I feel really bad that we're not going to get to all these fantastic questions that people are asking. But uh, one common theme that I see here is a lot of folks are asking about Mars and the probability that we'll be able to colonize Mars. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that word. Uh, a lot of baggage with the word colonize. It never never goes well for the people who live uh, where the other people are colonizing. And Mars, you know, Mars doesn't have life on it, probably. It might, it might. Uh, we were talking about this before the, before the talk got started. Um, if, if Mars has life on it, do we have the right to go there and live there? And it turns out that's an interesting question. Even if it's microbial, um, it's not as clear cut as you might think. Um, and, you know, I prefer the word base, you know, at least if you talk about a base, you're, 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 you're thinking more of exploration terms and scientific discovery terms. That might be better. Um, but even then, it's hard. Uh, you know, just getting to Mars is really hard. And um, if you, if, if by some miracle you get there in one piece, well, now you're on the worst place you can imagine. You know, people always said, oh, you know, what about these explorers that went to Antarctica? And it's like, yeah, but they were in ships where they could breathe. You know, they could, they could breathe the whole trip and they could get off their boat and stand on Antarctica and they could breathe the air. You can't do that on Mars. You have to bring everything with you or make it when you get there. And it's possible that you can make, uh, a, you know, oxygen out of the rocks on Mars. In fact, the Perseverance rover has a, an instrument called MOXIE, which I can't remember what that stands for, but it's basically going to try to suck carbon dioxide out of Mars's atmosphere and turn it into breathable oxygen. Uh, and the idea being that, you know, when humans go to Mars, we might be able to make our own oxygen. You can make water and other things like that. But you have to live someplace while you're there. You have to build your own habitats. They have to be airtight. You have to have water. You have to have food. Um, there's radiation issues on Mars. There are dust storms, which screw everything up. Uh, and it's not going to be easy. And in fact, um, it's going to be really, really, really hard. It may be the hardest thing anyone's ever done. So uh, is it possible? Technologically, I think yes. I think, you know, when you look at these problems as individual problems, um, yeah. Uh, and if you build a big honking rocket ship, yeah, you can bring a ton of supplies there. Uh, so it's really just a, a, a financial issue. Can you build 10,000 rockets that can take everything you need? Um, the question is, you know, can we? Psychological issues, social issues. And what, you know, what, who, who goes to Mars and who stays behind? Uh, that's an interesting question, right? Is there, is there bias? You know, if, if, if SpaceX is going to take people to Mars, um, there's a lot of privilege involved there. It's, it's, he's he's going to take people that had the ability to become well-educated and had the opportunities in their life, you know, not to be shot, not, you know, to, to go to college, to be able to get a good job and all these kind of things. And so you, you start to select out for a lot of different groups. Uh, and so you've got to be careful there. You don't want, uh, you know, you don't want everybody to be very hom uh, you know, homogenous when they get to Mars. Uh, so there's a lot of, lot of things to think about here. So is it possible? Yes. Is it feasible? I don't know. And I mean that in the literal sense of I don't know. It may very well be, but it may not be. We don't have a really great history of human exploration on this planet. And, and those problems have not gone away. Um, we've, just, we've just added our technology to them. So I'll be very interested to see how this plays out. Thank you very much. Um, I just have to say there were a lot of questions that I couldn't get I'm to. Sorry. And I talked too much. Well, I answer things too no, well. that is a sign of a truly great talk when it inspires this much curiosity. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm going to kick this back over to Aaron. Yes, uh, you, Phil, I want to thank you again. And uh, selfishly, I selfishly, if I could just ask you one more on a <laughs> on a personal note, I would just I'm just thinking like uh, Phil, you've accomplished so much in your life as a science communicator and in the field of astronomy and like, what keeps you going and like, what goals do you have left? Like that, that keep you going and like, what, what do you want to achieve looking, you know, 10, five, 10, you know, 20 years? Like, well, uh, yeah. What, what do you want? Yeah. That's a good question. There's a flippant answer. Um, having a mortgage that keeps you going. Um, you know, the bank, the bank isn't like, Oh, 
you didn't feel like writing that month. That's fine. It's like, no, we, we kind of want you to write all the time so that you can pay us. Um, but, but honestly, I mean, it, what motivates me, if I had to write about the same thing all the time, I would lose my mind. But there's always new stuff and new ways to think about stuff. I've got this article about Mars tomorrow, about this discovery of what happened to the water. And it kind of segues into life on Mars and, and, and whether Mars was ever habitable or is now. Or if, I mean, if there's life on it or, or if there is now. Um, and reading those papers made me think about things differently. Um, there's a, there is an embargoed news result coming out on Friday. Uh, embargo just means I can't talk about it. It's, it, they're holding it back so that everybody gets a chance to write about it all at once. You will hear about this on Friday. It's a big, very interesting discovery about cosmology, about the universe itself. And, um, uh, I've been waiting for this for a long time. Uh, I did some work on Hubble, uh, that was speculative at the time and basically impossible given what we had at the time, but has now become possible in the 20 years since then. And um, I, I read the paper and went, oh yeah, they, they, they got this. We, we didn't have a chance at seeing this, but they got it. Uh, and, and so that's a brand new thing. And, I've, and I've, I, I literally have got 20 tabs open on my browser of um, a, a new picture of M106, a gorgeous spiral galaxy that I just, just want to write about it because it's pretty, right? Uh, and a discovery about volcanoes on other planets. And there's just always new cool stuff to write about. And I really don't want to... Just, you know, it's like, oh, I've got to write about another freaking globular cluster. And I, it's, it's almost never like that. It's always, oh, I get to write about this, not I have to write about this. Um, and I love it. And it keeps me going. And, oh. and you asked where I want to be in five years. I have no idea. Um, I'd love to do more TV. Um, I've been doing some science consulting on movies. Um, like Marvel movies, they always have a science consultant on them. Uh, and that's like a big dream of mine. Um, I'm a complete and utter fanboy nerd. Uh, and I've, I've been able to do some science consulting on shows and stuff and met actors and writers. And it makes me, makes my head explode. I can't believe I get to do that. Uh, and so doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, you know, today, that doesn't have to be 10 years from now. That can, that can be today. Uh, if anybody's listening, any of you Hollywood uh, uh, producers out there. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's plenty of stuff I want to be doing. Well, you might run into uh, our trustee, uh, Dwayne Andrews, who's on the call, who uh, often goes to Comic-Con uh, events as Nick Fury. So if you'd like to connect <laughs> with him, then uh, then I'll have to connect you to afterwards. But Very you know, cool. I think like what I'm getting from this evening is just so it's just so special. And we're just so honored. I, I think I speak for a lot of us here. Um, just the, you know, just the, the energy is just so authentic and I know personally, I, I'm just so honored that you're here and I, I, I will definitely do my part and we'll all do our part to bring your energy and your excitement and your time and, and what you've given to us. You know, we not, might not get a lot of moments like this in our lives. So I, I pledge to you that we will take this energy and, you know, spread it out to our community. We have a nice group here tonight and, uh, you know, this virtual world has been a bit hard for a lot of us, but it's opened us opportunities to talk to you and engage with you, Phil. And we really appreciate it. And when we get together in person again, we're gonna we're certainly gonna take all this momentum and this community building and try to spread it out to different groups of people and new people and just connect some bridges and things like that. So uh, we're just so honored for that you're here. Like you're, it's just very, very inspiring work. And just don't ever forget that. I'm sure you don't. But uh, it's well, that, that's a lot. the best thing. Yeah. That's the best thing I could hope for. Right, is to be able to inspire other people and get them to enjoy this stuff as much as I do. And so, you know, the honor is mine. I'm just some guy sitting at home writing about the stuff he loves. And so for you to invite me to, to, to say that what I have something to say is important enough or at least interesting enough to, to talk about that, that's thrilling. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And on that note, uh, we will be ending the call. And uh, again, it seems a little bit abrupt, but uh, we'll be able to uh, share and uh, in community once again. Thank you again, Phil. And uh, have thank a great everybody. night, everyone. All right.